So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us in person. Thank you for those of you joining us on Zoom for our second Lunchtime Expedition presentation of 2024. I'd like to give a special thank you to all of our members in the audience. Thank you for helping to support the center and support programming such as this. If you're not a member, you can do so by going to centerofthewest.org backslash, or is it forward slash? I believe it's a forward slash membership. So my name is Corey Inko. If you don't know me, I'm the curator here of the Draper Natural History Museum. And running our AV in the uh, sound booth up above in the crow's nest is Amy Phillips, our curatorial assistant. So if you're enjoying this program on YouTube or if you're joining us live via Zoom, you have Amy to thank for that. Um, just a quick announcement. As always, please take your electronic mobile cellular device, turn that one on airplane mode or off, and that will minimize any disturbance uh, during uh, today's presentations. Um, if this is your first time joining us, these lectures are being recorded. We upload them to YouTube within usually a couple business days. If we don't get it out by Friday afternoon, usually by Monday afternoon, it's up on YouTube. So you just go to YouTube.com, you search Draper Natural History Museum, you look for our bear icon or logo, and you'll see playlists of all of our presentations dating back to 2018. Um, if you'd like to be added to our email list serve, we send out a notice uh, about every about a week before to two weeks before it varies. Um, ahead of each presentation, give you the rundown registration links for each of the um, um, upcoming presentations, as well as links to previous ones in there. So definitely please uh, uh, sign up for that to check it out. If you'd like to be added, come flag me down afterwards, and Amy and I will get you uh, onto the, the list serve. Um, and also feel free to invite family and friends um, you know, as you feel comfortable to, to, to join these incredible, wonderful, enriching lectures. Hey, hey we just had that announcement. <laughs> turn off, turn, here's, here's your second reminder. If you have an electronic mobile cellular device, turn, turn that device on silent or airplane mode. We've been fortunate enough to offer these programs for free. Thank you to generous sponsorship by the Nancy Carroll Draper Charitable Foundation as well as Sage Creek Ranch. There are also several audience members here that have helped support these programs too. If you are interested or you feel compelled to donate, you can also come find Amy or myself afterwards and we can get you linked up with that. Um, so we do appreciate uh, all of you being here in attendance. We also appreciate bringing in folks um, near and also far uh, for these wonderful presentations. Um, so. Upcoming presentations, just uh, you saw the flashing around here in the uh, screen, you know, definitely mark your calendars. We will update this each time as well. Um, there will be no April presentation, um, but uh, some will not be the first uh, Thursday of the month. For example, in July, that first Thursday falls in tandem with uh, the 4th of July. So we figure, you know, folks might be traveling. We want to ensure a good audience for our speakers. So that one's going to be pushed back to July 11th. But be sure to check these dates, check the email, another good reason to sign up um, to keep up to date on when the latest uh, presentations are going to be and who the speakers will be. So today, we are going to hear from Miss Julia Cook. And before I introduce our speaker, I'd also like to highlight the importance of imagery. So conservation and management efforts aimed at protecting and enhancing biodiversity often relies on the use of high impact visuals. This can come in many forms, from physical objects or specimens, to photography, um, to cinematography or film video footage. Increasingly, photographs and videos are leveraged as a means of communicating science and reaching wider audiences. The Draper has used photographs from Julia, from Rebecca Childers, our registrar here um, at the Center of the West, from Kathy Lichtendahl, um, and others in interpretive text, in social media, as well as in panels, exhibit panels in the museum. As you enjoy today's presentation, I encourage you to think about the power of photography in aiding and furthering the communication efforts of scientific research. Julia Cook is a wildlife photographer, naturalist, and a volunteer in the preparation lab at the Draper Natural History Museum. Growing up in Cody, less than an hour from Yellowstone, she developed a love for nature at an early age, which eventually led her to pick up wildlife photography. She proceeded to attend the University of Wyoming, where she earned her Bachelor's of Science in Environment and Natural Resources and a Bachelor of Arts in History. During the summers and on winter break, Julia would return to Cody and once more join the volunteer ranks in the preparation lab. Not one to sit idle for very long, Julia is now pursuing wildlife and outdoor photography full time. You would think that in her free time that she would fill it with a myriad of other hobbies, but no, Julia spends most of her free time in the field photographing various species of wildlife, though grizzly bears are her favorite. 
Her overall goal in photography is to capture impactful images of native wildlife that highlights the, wilder the wildness of the American West while inspiring others to care about wildlife conservation. Cook is also dedicated to ethical wildlife photography in order to keep wildlife wild and allow them to behave naturally without interference. Without further ado, please welcome Miss Julia Cook. All the tricks. Let's do. Let's do. Uh, control D. Or we do it this way. So before I get started, I'd like to thank Corey and Amy for the introduction and for having me here today. I'd like to thank, ev thank everyone that's here in person and anyone who is tuning in remotely over Zoom. Uh, so I'm here to talk a little bit about wildlife photography, um, but for before I get started, I'd like to give a quick introduction as to what I do. So like Corey said, I've been volunteering down in the Draper Lab for about six years now, and with that, I've got to be a part of some really cool hands-on projects working with a lot of animals that have met their demise through human-wildlife conflict and also work hands-on with a lot of specifically large mammals like bears, wolves, mountain lions, and some various other small animals as well. And so I've learned a lot through this process just about the anatomy of these animals and also getting to learn kind of hands-on about the behavior and all sorts of other things about these animals that not a lot of other photographers are able to do. And so I'm, I'm very thankful for all the really cool projects I've got to be a part of and anything Corey and Amy throw our way, uh, even though sometimes it is a bit smelly, but I, I do really enjoy the time. <laughs> Uh, so like Corey said, I grew up here in Cody, and like a lot of you who are longtime residents of Cody, I've loved going up to Yellowstone, grew up fishing on Yellowstone Lake, going camping up the North Fork, and just going for family drives um, into Yellowstone as well. So that gave me a really deep love for nature from a really early age. And I, once I started to get my driver's license, I just would go to Yellowstone all the time with my dog Beach and just kind of get out in nature and explore nature a little bit more on my free time. I got my uh, Bachelor of Science in Environment and Natural Resources and a Bachelor of Arts in History from the University of Wyoming. And I graduated this last May, and you might think that both of those things are kind of random, especially since I'm here to talk to you guys about wildlife photography. But I've actually never taken a photography course because when I started at the university, I was not even interested at photography, in photography at that point. This is actually what most of my college experience looked like. COVID hit during the spring semester of my freshman year, so that pushed everything online. And at first it was a really hard adjustment not being on campus, not being with my friends, and not being able to see my professors face to face. But I quickly realized that being back in Cody, I was back close to Yellowstone and spent even more of my free time out in nature, especially in Yellowstone as well. And I just sort of picked up a camera as a creative outlet during that time. And I got hooked really, really quickly and it sort of snowballed to what it is now. Um, I decided because I loved wildlife photography so much, I would take online classes in that fall semester as well, and the fall semester throughout all the rest of my college experience as well. So what that allowed me to do was to be here starting in May all the way to when the Eastgate closes at the end of October and spend as much time as I possibly can out in the field photographing wildlife. And being out in the field taking a lot of blurry photos, a lot of bad photos, that really helped me improve quickly and progress my photography career to where it is today. So I'm very thankful that my professors and advisors at UW were willing to work with me and kind of customize my college experience and allow me to have a lot of really unique experiences out in the field and learning being out in nature instead of learning only from being in a classroom. I also got a photojournalism grant at the end of my junior year at UW, which gave me grant funding for a photojournalism project I'll talk about a little bit later on, but that gave me funding to spend a full summer in Yellowstone, again photographing wildlife, but also gave me funding to spend about a month up in Alaska, where I was able to photograph a bunch of new species like coastal brown bears, puffins, and sea otters. So that was, again, a really unique experience that I was able to have through the University of Wyoming's ability to kind of work with me and customize my education. This is just a quick example of how my photography progressed, again, being out in the field and taking a lot of very blurry photos and learning from those mistakes. 
uh, the bear in all of these photos is actually the same individual bear, so I've got to grow and kind of photograph the same individuals through several different years, which has been a really interesting experience as well, especially watching these bears grow up. So when I first started photographing this bear, she was a subadult, just kind of recently on her own from her mother. And this past year, she actually had cubs of her own for the first time. So that was, again, really interesting, being able to spend all that time out in the field and photographing bears. Before I get started talking any more about wildlife photography, I want to talk a little bit about wildlife photography ethics, because I think it's really important and something people don't often talk about. So by ethics, that basically just means keeping wildlife wild and making sure nothing that you're doing is affecting that animal's ability to be wild or to live its natural life and present natural behaviors. So there are a couple of different things. Everyone kind of has their own opinion on what ethical wildlife photography looks like. But for me, that is doing nothing that affects that animal's natural behavior. So no baiting, no using artificial calls, and keeping a respectful distance away. So in Yellowstone, they have regulations in place to stay 100 yards away from bears and wolves and 25 yards away from anything else. And I follow those same regulations whether I'm in Yellowstone or not, and also pay a lot of attention to an animal's um, body language to just show if they're in stress or are anxious by my presence at all. So different signs, like if their ears are pinned back or if you can see the whites of their eyes, those are all signs that they're a little bit stressed. So if I'm in a scenario where an animal looks stressed by my presence, I'll take a few steps back and, and maybe make myself small, stay low to the ground, and stay very still. And if that animal still continues to stare or show signs of stress, I'll completely remove myself from that scenario. So I think that there is no one individual photo that is worth risking that animal's ability to be wild and to live naturally, especially when animals, especially in this ecosystem, are continually stressed out by other aspects of the human development, whether that's roadways or from noise pollution, or just having people kind of in their environment and coexisting with animals. Um, so that's my stance on ethics. Everyone, again, has their, their own kind of personal opinion on what can, is considered ethical. But for any of you who are photographing wildlife or even just observing wildlife, I encourage you to pay attention to their body language and make sure that they are not bothered by your presence there. This is where gear comes in. Uh, really important because it lets you take close-up photos without actually putting yourself physically close to an animal without talking too much about all like the technical jargon of camera equipment because it is kind of confusing. Uh, I shoot with a Canon R5 and a 300 millimeter lens so that means that that only shoots at that length. You can't really zoom in or out and so for wildlife photography anything really over 300 or more would be great for wildlife photography again because it lets you keep that safe distance from animals. I also have a 150 to 600, and that would be one where you could zoom in and out. So at the full zoom of that lens, it would be over twice as zoomed in as my other lens. So I use that when animals are a little bit further away in order to, again, keep that safe distance. I use binoculars a lot, too, as well, um, just being able to view wildlife and look for wildlife. And a cool trick that I've learned is if you hold the lens of your phone camera, up to the eyepiece of your binocular, you can take a photo that way. So for anyone who doesn't have any of these you know, long telephoto lenses, that's another way that's really easy to be able to take closer up photos of animals just by using binoculars, which I'm sure a lot of you here in the audience today have those as well. So I want to talk a little bit about why I think this Yellowstone ecosystem is the best for wildlife photography in North America. I'm obviously a little bit biased from growing up here, um, but I think it, it, the biodiversity in this ecosystem is incredible. Every photo that you're seeing up here is of a different species that we have in the Yellowstone ecosystem, and that's not even counting the animals I've not yet been able to photograph, like a pine marten or a bobcat or a mountain lion. So the immense biodiversity we have here is just incredible. And what I love is when I drive up to the park, I have absolutely no idea what I could see. And my joke was always I could see a wolverine, which was a funny joke until I actually saw a wolverine, which is an incredible experience. I was unable to photograph it, but it was a good reminder just how rich this ecosystem is in biodiversity. And so I want everyone to imagine that you're leaving Cody and you're driving up the North Fork and you drive through the tunnels and then you're winding along the reservoir and before long you're in Wapiti. And from Wapiti you continue on and you're in the National Forest. And from there you continue the rest of the way to Pahaska and then that last stretch going up the hill to the East Gate. And that's a 50 mile stretch of road. But in that 50 mile stretch of road, you could see mule deer or elk or bison or a grizzly bear or a wolf or a bald eagle or a black bear or a fox. There's just such rich biodiversity in this ecosystem. And what I think is really unique as well is even though the ecosystem is so vast, a lot of these animals kind of overlap in their range. So like I said, I spent about a month up in Alaska. And what I found in Alaska is it's a phenomenal place for wildlife photography. But pretty much everywhere I was, I was there to photograph maybe one or two other species, that everything is very isolated and very, very spread out. So what I like here is I can go out into the field and I might see nothing. There are very many days where I do see nothing. 
Um, but there are very many days as well where I have, you know, incredible wildlife sightings and can see a vast um, assortment of wildlife species we have here as well. So this ecosystem here, it's just, it's, it's really hard to beat the Yellowstone ecosystem. I want to talk about a couple of different styles of photography, and my first style I'm going to talk about are these portrait photos. Um, these are probably my favorite photos to be able to capture, although the opportunity doesn't always present itself. Um, so these are these like kind of close-up photos. It gets a really close-up feel, almost feels like you're looking directly at this wolf or this bear, and feels like you're part of that image. And like Corey said, my overall goal with photography is to create these impactful images that connect people with nature and inspire people to spend time out in nature, as well as make people care about wildlife conservation. So I think these photos are very attention grabbing, being that really close up photo, because it's not very often that you are ever really face to face with a grizzly bear. And I hope that's true for everyone, that you've never had that close of an encounter with a bear. Um, but with the, the photography equipment that I use, I'm able to capture those, those photos that are very close up. And I think they're very attention grabbing as well. So here's a few more examples. And I'm often sharing these photos on social media. And what I hope is that when people are just kind of mindlessly scrolling through social media, that one of these photos will kind of grab their attention. And will, people will look at this grizzly bear and be like, wow, I really want to learn more about that grizzly bear. Or better yet, to say, I want to go to Yellowstone and see this grizzly bear. A couple other styles of photos that I like are these kind of environmental photos, or what I call them. And these kind of add more context to what the animal is doing and to their environment as well. So in Yellowstone, we have a very unique um, scenario to be able to photograph wildlife in thermal areas, like this bison here. So if I had taken that close-up portrait of the bison, you would have only seen that animal's head. And while I think that those kinds of photos are impactful, there's also a place for these photos as well, where you, you see the context of this bison walking through the meadow, and you can see the thermal areas back in the background as well, especially in Yellowstone, just the unique environments and landscapes that we have in Yellowstone as well. Here's another example. This is down in Grand Teton National Park this past fall. And this moose was crossing the river. And again, if I'd taken that close-up photo, you would have missed the fact that this moose was crossing the river and that these beautiful fall colors were just st starting to be illuminated by the rising sun. So the, the close-up photos are important, but I also love these environmental photos because to me, everything in this photo that's interesting is the river and the background of the fall colors as well. So I do like the moose, but the, everything else that the moose is doing in its environment makes this photo interesting in my opinion. Here's another example. And for any of you who have seen bighorn sheep, we know what a rugged environment that they live in, their steep cliff sides, and their amazing ability to navigate this really steep terrain. And to me, that's why I find these animals so interesting. But for someone who's never seen a bighorn sheep or really knows nothing about bighorn sheep, they might not know that. But by looking at this photo, if you know absolutely nothing about bighorn sheep and have never even heard of one, you could look at this photo and, and see the steep hillside and the cliff in this very mountainous terrain that this bighorn sheep is not only living in, but thriving in. So again, it just adds more context to the photos. If I had taken that close-up portrait shot here, you would have missed that added context of this, this insane, rugged environment that these animals live in. And so this was up off the side of Sylvan Pass just before the park closed this year. So very snowy, a very steep environment for anyone who's familiar with Sylvan Pass. And that's why I love this photo, again, the, the mountainous terrain in the background. You can just see kind of the never-ending mountains behind it. So for someone who might be scrolling through social media in you know, some New York City who's never seen a, mount, a, a bighorn sheep, they would be able to see the context of where this animal lives and how these animals live their lives. Another environmental aspect that I'm always trying to capture is weather, which obviously is the easiest to capture during winter. I took this photo just this past week up in Yellowstone, and a really big snowstorm was blowing in. And so I stopped to photograph this elk because he was walking through this pretty deep snow while the snow was still continually falling. And I really like that you can see this snow that's gathering up on its antler tines. And again, looking at this photo, it's not like this elk is bedded down and completely cowering from this storm. It's out trudging through the snow and continually pushing along and thriving in this winter environment. And it could care less that it's snowing or not. It's just out there in, in nature and, and walking through the snow. And I, I love that and showing the harsh conditions that we have here in Wyoming. We know how much it snows and how much the wind blows. But people that don't know that and have never been to Wyoming could gain a small understanding of the harsh winters that these animals endure from looking at this photo. Another kind of, these are kind of like a crossover between the portrait shot and the environmental shot. This is actually the same bear cub in both of these photos, just about two or three weeks apart. And I like these because it is like the close-up photo. You can see, you know, the expression on the bear cub's face. But you also see that the wildflowers around it, and again, adds context 
to what time of year this is. This is at the middle of summer when wildflowers are blooming and also see what the cub is doing, just kind of sitting there. And I think these are very interesting photos as well. So again, every kind of scenario has a different kind of photo that you can capture. And I'm always trying to look for something that's different and unique in terms of wildlife photography. Other things that I'm always looking to photograph is any kind of interaction between animals. Um, so especially like pack animals or herd animals. So this is the Wapiti Lake pack a couple years ago. And at this time, the, a few members of the pack had kind of been resting along the tree line while the rest of the pack had been out hunting. And at this point was when the pack kind of like came back together and reunited. And so from looking at this photo, if you had to guess which wolf in this photo is the alpha male, which wolf would you guess? Yeah, this far one here with its tail back out, standing very assertive, that's the alpha male. And so from this photo, you can see the pack dynamic within this wolf pack. You have the, the alpha male who's standing very assertive and very dominant, but then you also have some other wolves who are cowering down low. They're in a very submissive body language. And so you can see the dynamic within the hierarchy of this wolf pack. And these kinds of photos, I think, are very interesting and tell a broader story as well into the social dynamic of wildlife, and especially wolves. These photos are also quite difficult to photograph um, and capture because you sort of often end up with like someone who's not facing the camera or like a, a random leg that's in the background. And so in terms of kind of moving around animals and trying to capture a photo, this is probably one of the more difficult ones that I've captured. This is a bighorn a ram, a ewe, and a lamb. And this was up the North Fork this fall. And these three had kind of been hanging pretty close together pretty consistently. Um, but there was probably a dozen or so other ewes that were in the area. And I wanted to capture a photo of kind of like this small family group. Um, but I had to maneuver around until I finally got an angle where there was not another random sheep in the background. Um, so they are difficult to, to capture these where there's not something really distracting in the background. Um, but when you are able to capture these photos, I think they're very interesting. And I like the sweet moment here of, you know, like a little sheep family out in the wild. Again, this is a, another example. You kind of have to have the wildlife cooperate with you to some level. And so I'd been out photographing these river otters up on the Lamar River up in Yellowstone for probably two hours. And I wanted to get a group photo of these otters. And I'd been able to get a photo of like each individual otter. And they'd jump up on the ice and dive back down into the river and catch fish. And it was really interesting to watch. But I wanted to get a photo like this. And so finally, two of the river otters were up on the ice. And so I just started photographing them. And it wasn't until I got home and was looking at these on my computer that I realized that the third otter finally cooperated <laughs> and stuck its head up through the eyes to be able to get a photo of all three of them. So there is some level of, of having to have the wildlife cooperate. And, and sometimes they're stubborn, and it's really frustrating because it doesn't work out. But again, other times, something like this lines up perfectly. And this was a group of bull moose that were down in the Tetons. And they were all clustered together in the early morning. And it was just an absolute mess to try to photograph because you couldn't really get an angle where it didn't just look like a big brown blob out in the middle of the sagebrush. Um, so I was just about ready to leave when the moose kind of started moving, and they walked up on this ridge line and got evenly spaced out walking the ridge line, uh, which was a really great moment, and I was thankful that the moose cooperated in that moment to be able to capture this photo. So when the animals cooperate, it's always an, a nice benefit as well. Other things in terms of interaction that I'm looking to photograph, especially like during the rutting season for like moose and elk and the bison, those are always very exciting times as a wildlife photographer. So I look forward to the elk rut and the moose rut every single year. Um, this is an example. This was just um, down in a really open meadow. And these two bulls, had they were kind of bugling back and forth. And then they met in the middle of this meadow, just as the sun was kind of rising up. And they were just about to start sparring. Um, so that, again, showing the interaction between these animals and the dynamic that these wild animals have, especially during the reddening season, which is always, again, really interesting to photograph and something I look forward to every year. Another example of interaction between animals that I'm looking to photograph is always mother and offspring, and especially grizzly bears. Um, they're definitely my favorite animal, and this is one of my favorite photos I captured this past year. This is a grizzly bear and her cub, and if you're thinking this cub looks really, really big, it's because at this point, this cub was three years old. And at this point, most grizzly bears have been on their own for about a year at this age. However, this mother bear keeps her cubs about an extra year or so. So at this point, they were almost equal in size, as you can see. But I really like this photo because you can see how similar they look. And again, they lined up perfectly to have the same look in the same direction and be standing 
shoulder to shoulder. But you can see the same blonde coloration in their face and the same kind of large nose. And they actually have the exact same blonde shoulder blades across their right shoulder. Um, but that's the shoulder that's facing the opposite direction. So you can't see that in this photo. And this was just about a week before this grizzly bear kicked this cub off to be out in the wild for the first time. So I'm very thankful that, again, this moment lined up perfectly to show this interaction of kind of like the last week of having the cub with the mother. And if any of you have been up in Yellowstone and have heard of the Lake Butte sow, or she's also called raspberry, this is that bear and her cub. Here's a few more examples of interactions between mother and offspring. I think they're always very sweet moments when, when things line up perfectly. Uh, so here we have a mule deer fawn and its mother that were just kind of off in this really nice backlit meadow. And I was able to photograph them as they kind of you know, walked up for a little nose touch, which was really sweet. And then a mountain goat and a kid up in the Beartooths with this nice you know, wild flowers again. So again, pulling in elements of their environment to add more context to what they're doing and also showing the interaction between the mother and the kid. Other things I'm always looking to photograph, which are a little bit more challenging, are interactions between members of different species. This is definitely one of my favorite photos I've ever captured and definitely my favorite example of interactions between different species. So this was just about two years ago. Of the Wapiti Lake Pack had killed a deer kind of down in like a really steep ravine. And they had fed all morning and had gone back up over the hill um, to kind of lay down upon a hill. And this wolf was just sitting kind of looking down where the carcass was. And I just had my camera up by chance trying to get like a portrait photo of this wolf. And this raven flew in directly overhead above the wolf's head, which was a perfect moment. And I'm really glad that I had my camera up because if I you know, had my camera in my hand and saw this happening, there would be no chance that I would have been able to capture this moment. And if anyone knows anything about either of these species, you know how much they interact with each other and the incredible relationship that they have. So ravens will follow wolves when they're hunting, knowing that they can pick off all the easy scraps off of whatever the wolves kill when they are done feeding. And wolves have learned that ravens will circle overhead above a carcass, which will then help the wolves locate carcasses, especially like winter kill or anything like that during especially this time of the year. Uh, so this is definitely my favorite photo, and I just love the interaction in that, that really specific moment that shows how connected nature is. Another example, and I was hesitant to include this photo, um, but of interaction is between predation, and it's something I'm always looking to photograph. I'm certainly never hoping that you know the little deer fawn that I'm photographing is going to have a bear come and run out and, and catch it. But I think it's something that's important as a wildlife photographer to capture and to also share these images. So anytime I share this photo on social media, I get a bunch of comments of saying, you know, I, I just want to see the beautiful photo of the moose that's you know crossing the river or the bear cub that's sitting in the flowers. I don't want to see this side of nature. And I think as a wildlife photographer, I have a responsibility to document this side of nature and also share that. Because um, I think it's dangerous to think of these animals and only think of them in that very beautiful sense. And nature is very beautiful, but at times it can be brutal as well. And I think it's important to document and share these photos as well. And this is actually really the only instance of predation that I've ever seen. Uh, this is, again, a bear that I photographed for several years. And this was in the late evening a couple of summers ago. And I was watching her kind of down in this little creek bed. And she was just digging around and foraging. And all of a sudden, she stood up and took off running, which was a very unusual behavior for her. I'd never seen her do that before. And in about 15 seconds, she was on top of this pond. And it was really a powerful moment to be able to watch that, let alone to photograph it. And so I'm glad that I was there in this moment to be able to document this and be able to share it and show that you know this is another side of nature. Even though our grizzly bears in the Yellowstone ecosystem have a substantial portion of their diet consist of forage and vegetation, they do also feed on, um, on carcasses and, and hunt when they can and when the opportunity arises. So I think it's, again, important to show the side of nature as well and not ignore that this happens out in nature. If you have not been able to tell, my favorite animal by far are grizzly bears. And I, I just love them for their, their facial expressions. They all have like a really interesting personality and the different way that they interact with each other as well. This past year, I photographed 52 individual grizzly bears, which is more than I've ever photographed in a year. So every bear up here is a different individual. And I'm able to identify them through a mix of things like if they have ear tags. So you can see this bear up in the, in the top. He's got two double red ear tags. And he's tagged as research number G274. So that's a number that the National Park Service has assigned to this bear in order to identify him and carry out different studies in the future as well, maybe fit him with a radio collar in the future. 
And so things like ear tags or if they have radio collars, also the general area as well, uh, especially female bears tend to stay in the same general area and don't tend to really disperse much. So general area is also really big in identifying bears. Also things like coloration and different size as well are all different ways that I'm able to identify a bear. And so I won't count a bear as a different bear that I photographed unless I'm 100% certain that it is a different bear. So because bears are my favorite animal, working here in lab, I've worked hands-on with a variety of bears that have met their demise from human wildlife conflict. So a couple of examples, a bear that had to be euthanized by the Wyoming Game and Fish because it had gotten into cat food that was not stored properly at a cabin and had to be euthanized. Or a bear that was hit on the North Fork by a car driving at night. And so these are all instances of these bears that have met their demise through human wildlife conflict. And I was really inspired working hands-on with a lot of these animals to start a photojournalism project showing how we coexist with bears, how we interact with bears, and the different ways that bears interact on a very human landscape. So I applied for the Large Bristol Photojournalism Grant through the University of Wyoming, which I received. And I used that funding to start this photographic and photojournalist project. And again, I spent a month up in Alaska because I wanted to photograph the way that humans interact differently with bears in Alaska because they have access to the salmon from the salmon run. So during that time up in Alaska, bears are not aggressive hardly at all in the coastal areas. So I traveled to Katmai National Park to photograph the salmon run up there and bears would walk right down the trail and would not even pay attention to people at all because they have so much food that they don't even care that you're there. Um, but here in the Yellowstone ecosystem, it's a little bit different, as you all know. And so I started this photojournalist project uh, two years ago, and it's something that I'm continuing on and always looking for these moments to be able to capture and kind of continue moving this project on into the future as well. So th this is a first example that I have to share with you today, and this is what you would call a roadside female. And so this bear is one that frequents roadways here in the Yellowstone ecosystem. And some female bears have learned that if they stay close to the roads, their cubs have a higher chance of survival because their cubs have a lower chance of getting killed by male bears, which will kill cubs. And male bears also tend to be very skittish around human developed areas and tend to stay a lot farther back into the backcountry. So because of this learned behavior, females have learned to stay close to the roads in order to protect their cubs. And that's what we would refer to as a roadside female. So this bear has actually had several cubs in the past who had all died either through natural causes or from being killed by male bears. And so this was two years ago. This was actually during the time that the park was flooding. And this was only about a quarter mile from the East Gate. And I was up, uh, up the North Fork with my parents and we were watching this bear. And she crossed the road several different times just foraging along the side of the road. And it was really interesting to watch. And, you know, she'd, just, she'd cross the road directly and, and not be walking down the middle of the road, which is always a good thing for these bears. Um, but this cub is the one that she got all the way through that whole first summer, and I was able to photograph it several other times that summer. And this past summer, I was also able to photograph this cub as a year-old cub. So she got this cub through the whole first year of its life. And this spring, I'm anxiously waiting to see if this cub survived to the point where it will be independent from its mother. Probably this spring is likely the timeline um, for being off on its own. Here's another close-up shot of this cub. This is what you would call a koi, which just means cub of the year. So this cub would have been born in February sometime, and this was in June, so a, only a couple of months old. And it was really interesting, again, just watching the behavior between the mother and the offspring as well. This is a male bear, and like I said, they'll kill cubs. And so these, that's, again, the strategy of how these mothers have learned to stay close to the road. And this bear, you can see his ears are kind of back, and he was actually pursuing a female during the mating season. The female was by far much more comfortable along the road than he was, and they'd kind of been back in some, some thick willows, and the female started coming grazing up the hillside, just right on the other side of the guardrail. And he was definitely hanging back further into the willows, kind of uncertain what to do, if he was gonna follow her, and was really a lot more uncertain with all the people around and the people watching and, and all the, the human noises as well. So again, that, that shows how these male bears are very hesitant kind of around people as well. This is a bear I've not seen since. So he's definitely one that comes close to the roads during the mating season and is like way back there out in the back country. He maybe will occasionally come and cross road and then is just like gone back off into the wilderness on the other side of the road. This is probably my favorite photo that I captured during this photojournalist project. Um, and this was a really exciting time up in the park. If anyone's familiar with the steamboat um, point curve up in Yellowstone, very sharp corner. 
and I had been photographing this bear for probably an hour and a half. Again, my parents were with me for this specific encounter, as was my grandmother, who we said for a while was our good luck charm with bears, because anytime she'd be with us, we'd have these incredible wildlife sightings. And so on this particular day, this grizzly bear had just kind of been foraging off the side of the road in the snow. It was getting pretty late in the day, and this was pretty early on in the season, as you can see by the typical spring weather we have here in Yellowstone. Um, but this bear had been foraging off on the hill and had gone up over the hill, and which is a behavior I've seen her do before in the past. And so when she went over the hill, I thought maybe she would come down a drainage on the other side. And so we drove around to the other side of the hill, and sure enough, here's this bear that popped down on the road. And then she goes across the road and is just kind of foraging along again in a little meadow, and all of a sudden she was on top of a yellow-bellied marmot, which is what you see here in her mouth. And so she laid down and the snow's still falling and, and she's eating this marmot right off the side of the road, which was again a really interesting behavior to be able to watch and photograph. And all of a sudden a bison came walking down the road and it startled her, which would show how much we should be afraid of bison because this grizzly bear that probably weighs 250 pounds takes off running with this marmot in her mouth, running away from this bison. So the lake is over here and the road is here. So she's running parallel, kind of like between the lake shore and the road. And all of a sudden, she makes a really, really sharp right turn up towards the road. At about the same time, these two cars come around a blind corner in pretty low visibility because of the falling snow. So I'm waving my arm out the side window, making sure that these cars see this bear. And she thankfully was able to dart right between the two cars and was able to cross the road safely. Um, but I think this photo shows, again, just I think people think of having grizzly country and a road. And they don't think of the road as grizzly country, when in fact, bears can be seen from the road and often seen on the road. So I think people that come here to Yellowstone, if they knew that when they hear wildlife on road, that doesn't just mean there's mule deer on the road. That means that there are elk and bison and grizzly bears and wolves and all of these other things that live in the Yellowstone ecosystem can also be on the road because to the animals, the road is also just part of their environment. It's not separate from where they live. Um, so thankfully this bear was able to get across the road and, and everything was fine, but it was definitely a really, you know, stressful moment there for a few moments, you know, to see whether she was able to cross the road safely or not. This, to me, shows why bear management is so important. And when I say bear management, that could be something like the National Park Service has a bear management team. They also have the interagency grizzly bear study team. Places like the Wyoming Game and Fish and the Forest Service all play a role in bear management broadly. Um, so this is a bear management truck up in Yellowstone, and this was mid-October, like right before the park closed. We had a big snowstorm come in. And this mother grizzly, this is the same one I talked about earlier, known as the Lake Butte Sow. And so she and her two and a half year old cub are walking down the road. And normally that would be very bad because you want the bears to cross the road and not walk down the road. Uh, however, she had been hit by a car just a couple weeks before and had a pretty significant limp. And so bear management showed up and hazed them off the road by playing just loud siren noises, which was enough to get them up into this area with the trees and the fallen snow. And so she was having a pretty difficult time walking through all of that deep snow and crossing the logs. So bear management pulled back for a minute and let her drop back down onto the road. And instead of hazing her back off into the trees, they just followed her with their lights flashing, which allowed her to walk down the road where she was more comfortable and easier to maneuver while also letting it be very visible that there's something on the road. So after I captured this photo, I hopped in my car and followed bear management, and we sort of escorted them down the road before they merged up and went up the hill to the area where they typically hibernate. So it was a really kind of a great farewell to bears for the year of sort of just escorting these bears up to hibernation. This is the same bears again. This was this spring. And they were crossing the road. And what I love about this photo is the guy in his car with his cell phone out the window. And I really hope, I wish I knew who this guy was to know, I hope that he went back home to wherever he's from and, and showed all of his friends, look what I saw in Wyoming, and was just so excited about seeing these grizzly bears. Because again, I think people see photos of bears and think that I'm hiking miles and miles out into the backcountry to photograph bears, when in reality, every photo that I've showed you of a bear today has been taken from the roadside. So it just shows how accessible bear viewing is here in the Yellowstone ecosystem. And to move on to this next photo, this is the same cub that was in this previous photo. This was about a week later when she was just been kicked off from her mother and had been on her own independent for only a couple of hours. And she kind of went back and forth and back and forth and was trying to decide what she was going to do and, and where she was going to cross the road. And finally, she got up the nerve to just bolt straight across the road. 
But you can see here the cones that bear management leaves out. And what that does is it gives a very clear area for the bears to cross the road and blocks an area where cars aren't allowed to park. And very often, more times than not, the bears do cross exactly where bear management left the cones out for. Uh, so they are very smart and they know how to cross the roads, which sounds a bit crazy. But she walks up to the side of the road and the minute that she puts her paw on the road, she bolts and just runs straight across the road. And because she was new and on her own for the first time, she just kind of kept running. Um, but this is like conditioning to, to build up these bears to learn how to cross the road. So anytime there's a bear that is crossing the road and bear management is there, the second they put their paw down on the asphalt, they start clapping their hands and hollering in order to give a negative experience to being on the road. So these bears learn that the road is bad, I can cross the road, but I can't just sit on the road whenever I want to. And so that definitely helps with keeping our bears protected and making sure that the viewers who are sitting there watching the bears are also able to remain safe as well. This is that same bear. Again, this was just a couple of minutes before she crossed the road. You can really see how distressed she is, very unsure of what to do. And so after she crossed the road for the first time by herself, she sort of had like this newfound confidence and, and was more sure of herself out being out in the wild on her own for the first time. This is another example of a roadside bear. She's numbered 1063 down in the Tetons. She has ear tags and a radio tracking collar, which is a way that the rangers are able to monitor their movement and gain more data about how these bears interact in a human world. And so I like this photo because it really shows all aspects of the way we interact with bears. The bears crossing the road, you have photographers back here, you have people in their cars with their phones taking photos, and you also have bear management here. And a lot of the bear management is actually volunteer run, so these here are volunteers. <laughs> And their job is less bear management, more people management, to make sure that the people are staying a respectful distance away from the bears and that the bears are able to cross the road when they want to. She'd been foraging off one side of the road. She just wanted to cross the road and go back to foraging on the other side. Here's another close-up photo of 1063. She actually grew up roadside um, with a brother. And since they've been kicked off on their own, the brother has not really been seen alongside the roads often, which again shows how these male bears tend to be much more in the backcountry, whereas she as a female has stayed very close to the roads. She's very regularly seen along the roads, especially in the early spring and the late fall. This photo here, this is actually 1063's mother. And so this again shows how this bear grew up roadside. And now her mother has her own cubs again and is teaching these bears again how to be roadside bears. So in the instance that either of these cubs is a female, that bear will very likely again stay close to the road be a roadside mother, and when she grows up and has cubs of her own, she'll again raise those cubs being roadside and kind of continue this, this um, trajectory of having roadside females in these areas, again, using that protective strategy to keep their cubs safe. Here's another close-up photo of this bear. She's numbered 793 and her two cubs. Um, really fun to photograph and, and very curious cubs as well. Uh, to end with this photo, this is probably my, again, up there with one of my favorite photos from this project. And it had rained for the day before uh, up on the North Fork. And so I pulled over and stopped to look just along the muddy riverbank. This was in the fall, so the river was pretty low. And I wanted to see kind of what kind of animals had been in the area. So I found black bear tracks, moose tracks, and grizzly tracks. And I had my dog beach with me and we were just kind of walking along looking to see what had been in the area. And these had been from the night before and this was the late afternoon the next day. So I felt comfortable following these grizzly tracks for about 100 yards or so before the bear ended up crossing the river. And when I was walking back, I didn't realize that my footprints lined up perfectly with the way that this grizzly bear was walking. And so for me, I think this is a really powerful image to show we can coexist with grizzly bears. Uh, we might have to take certain precautions like carrying bear spray always, uh, making loud noises to avoid surprising a bear, but when we take these small changes, we are able to coexist with grizzlies in this ecosystem and how important that is, especially moving forward when all of these management decisions are up in the air, whether grizzly bears are going to be delisted and be able to be hunted, and how we are able to interact with bears safely and respect respectfully for the bears and also for ourselves here in this ecosystem. Uh, just to close with this is definitely one of my favorite photos, this bear up in the yellow flowers up in Yellowstone. And this is my website if anyone's interested in looking at any more of my work or any of my portfolios of other projects I've worked on as well. Any questions? At this time, Julia will take any questions you may have. <laughs> or criticisms. <laughs> yep. Go to the uh, otter shop. How many shots did you take? So you thought you got the right one. 
oh, I don't know, probably like a thousand, <laughs> quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, let's see. That one right there, yeah. So most of what I do is I take a bunch of photos and then I end up deleting almost all of them <laughs> and keeping the good ones. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Repeat the question of the mics. Oh, so that question was, how do I handle all the people around? And so that's definitely a thing. Anytime I get out with my camera and people see a big lens, people are immediately stopping to see what I'm looking for. And sometimes I'm just photographing like a wildflower. And I feel bad telling people, well, I'm really only looking at a wildflower, nothing terribly exciting. Um, but I do really enjoy, especially at bear jams, when there are a large amount of people around, I do really enjoy, you know, talking to people and educating them about the bears. So I try to look at it a little bit more on the positive side, you know, that I can be there to, to answer any questions about bears and, and tell them about the individual bears as well and try to see it more on the positive side than that there's so many people around. So. How do you handle the ethical problem there, though, as, as they start getting really close and, and uh, you know, you're taking yeah. a picture and the guy's walking in front of you and he's trying to get a picture with his cell phone. Yeah, that's a good question. So again, the ethical dilemma with having so many people around and especially people that maybe aren't following the rules. Um, so there have been times that I've said to people, you know, you're way too close to that bear, can you please back up or get back in your car? And a lot of times people, when I say, you know, that, that's this bear's safety that's at risk too, not only your own, and a lot of times people are like, wow, thank you so much for telling me. There have been a few instances where people are very critical and saying, you know, this is public land and, and I can do what I want. Um, there have been a few times where I've called bear management when the scenario is really bad and they'll come and manage, um, and manage that jam and, and make sure people are behaving properly. Yes. Yeah, so again, um, how am I able to identify different numbered bears? Um, I have a couple of friends that work bear management, so anytime I'm kind of unsure of what a bear's ID is, I can ask them, and they're very knowledgeable as well. Um, but also just looking if they have ear tags and, and a collar, and the same general area as well, um, they, they kind of tend to stay in the same area. And also comparing photos to if you know it's in the fall, and I'm looking at a photo, I can compare that photo to the spring and say, yeah, I think that is the same bear. Yeah. Yes? You mentioned that all the photos you saw, you saw, showed us today were roadside. Yes. Uh, and by the way, great, great pictures. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm just curious, are all of your photos roadside or do you hike for some of them, especially certain species? So do I ever hike looking for wildlife? So all the bear photos that I showed were from the roadway. Um, I don't necessarily feel comfortable hiking with the intention of finding a bear to photograph a bear. Um, I feel fine hiking out around, you know, with the intent of finding other animals. And I've never had an encounter on trail with a bear, which I'm very thankful for. Um, but some of the other species like red fox and moose and, and elk and bighorn sheep and, and those other you know, less dangerous species, I am often hiking around looking for those animals. How many <laughs> gigabytes or terabytes of data <laughs> do you have stored on your hard drives? I have a four terabyte hard drive, which is probably half full right now. So a lot of back storage of photos. <laughs> Good thing storage is getting cheaper. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. I do, yes, sir. So that question was, I shoot with a Canon brand camera, but I use a Tamron brand lens. So if I have any you know, issues with compatibility, uh, which I do not, I've not really noticed any difference in autofocus speed or anything like that between the two brands. Uh, nope, just connect them and it w works fine. So, yeah. Buzzy, did you have a question? Yeah, I was looking at one of the first photos you showed of the three, the four different years. Oh, yes. Talk about the aesthetics of how you're photography. Oh. Uh, so, yeah. Besides glory. <laughs> yeah. So that question was, I showed these photos of how my photography improved, but necessarily what in each photo shows that my photography has improved. Uh, so you can see in the photo from 2020, it's a little bit blurry and the bear isn't really sharp in that photo. Uh, 2021, I do really like this photo, but the, the background is kind of distracting. At that point, I was more focused on capturing the photo of the animal instead of paying attention to the background. And so between the jump from 2020 to 2022, I tried to start paying attention to what my background looks like to avoid capturing any kind of like distracting objects. So in the 2021 photo, there's a bunch of logs and branches that are closer to the bear, which I think are a little bit more distracting. And again, same thing with the 2023 photo is very clean background, no really random twigs or anything back there. Yes. Um, 
Yeah, so that question was, since I share these photos online, are they copyrighted and how do I protect these images and if I sell these images? Uh, so I do have a print shop where I do sell these photos and I do some print sales and I've also made calendars this last year which I was able to sell, which was a really cool kind of like new thing to be able to sell. And they are copyrighted um, under my business name and with that um, they're protected. So anyone who wants to use the images has to ask my permission beforehand. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. probably like that question was how many did I take for this 2023 photo to get that sharp? And oh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Corey's saying to say just one, which I wish was the, the truth. Um, but often I'm, I'm sitting there and, and just hitting the button as many times as I can to make sure that I get a sharp photo. This photo was actually um, right about the time it was almost too dark to be taking photos. And so what I did in that instance was I underexposed it to where it was almost very black when I was taking the picture and I brought the color back through post-processing and editing. So I do edit some of my photos uh, min minimally though to bring back what it looked like to my eye because a camera's never gonna be able to pick up uh, color as well as a human eye is able to. Yes? How long do you edit your photos? Uh, how long do I edit my photos? That kind of depends. Um, some photos are a very quick edit maybe like 10 minutes, 15 minutes on average. Other photos are a little bit more technical, like this one where I was bringing back the color and the light. Probably took me, you know, 45 minutes or so. So really tedious, but I do also really enjoy that process as well. Yes. So that was, what's my future with photography and what are my goals? So this past year was my first time really trying to do wildlife photography full time after I graduated from the University of Wyoming. And so with that, I've signed a couple contracts doing like freelance work um, for different magazines and things like that. And just trying to continue to grow my print sales. I'd like to get my, my photos into like a physical gallery space at some point. Um, but going forward in the future, just trying to di diversify my portfolio, photograph new species, and photograph species that I've photographed in a new and kind of different and interesting way. Yes. <laughs> That's a good question. How long do I head out before sunrise? So unfortunately, I'm not really a morning person, and I really wish that I was. So in the summer, um, I'll try to get to like the east gate by the time the sun is rising, so then I can look for wildlife on the way into the park. Um, so in the middle of summer, that can be like 4, 4.15 a.m. waking up, which is really hard, and I try not to do that multiple days in a row. So. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Have you heard social media being pinned off Instagram? Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that it helped your business and it's hindering your business? Do you enjoy that aspect of it? Yeah, so what's the role of social media in what I do business-wise and just photography-wise as well? Um, so I really enjoy sharing my photos on social media. I enjoy, you know, helping connect people with nature as well, and that goes back to some of my photography goals. Um, so I enjoy sharing my photos, and I always try to throw in a little bit of, like, educational bit um, about either the, the animal that I photographed or the story behind how I was photographing that animal. There are certain precautions that I take, though. I don't ever share, like, the specific location of where I photographed that animal. I'll either say just Wyoming broadly or Yellowstone National Park, uh, which is, again, a pretty broad area knowing how large Yellowstone is. So I won't ever give out specific locations. So if you take the geolocation uh, out of your, out of your, uh, your data on the file? Uh, so that question was, do I take the geolocation out of the file? Um, I do, and so I, actually what I do is I record in a journal where I saw the animal, uh, what time of day, what weather, and any like other notes, and then I take that information and put it into a custom Google map, which I actually got this idea from my friend Rebecca, who's also a photographer, and so I put all those points into a big map, and then I can look at it and compare year to year where wildlife trends were and, and things like that. So you take it out of your EXIS? Yes, yeah. Julia, thank you so much for your time. <laughs> thank you.